The prophet Isaiah foretells a Messiah whose life would summarize the history of his people and thus in time expand the new covenant. The Lord's servant will be a light to the nations. This is a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I'm honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up princes and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read the psalm responsively by verse. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 12. <clears throat> I waited patiently upon the Lord. He stooped to hear me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the desolate pit, out of the mire and clay. He set my feet upon a high cliff and made my footing sure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and stand in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Great things are they that you have done, O Lord my God. How great your wonders and your plans for us. There is none who can be compared with you. In sacrifice and offering you take no pleasure. You have given me ears to hear you. In the roll of the book, it is written concerning me. I love to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is deep in my heart. I proclaim righteousness to the great congregation. Behold, I do not restrain my lips. And that, O Lord, you know. Your righteousness have I not hidden in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your deliverance. I have not concealed your love and faithfulness from the great congregation. You are the Lord. Do not withhold your compassion from me. Let your love and your faithfulness be maintained forever. Okay. Paul begins his letter to the Corinthians with praise for their faith and discipleship, orienting them toward the God revealed in Jesus Christ as the author and perfecter of their faith. This is a reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from our God 
our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Mm. Thanks be to God.
There are uh, ways of looking at things, and we need every now and then to look at things at a different way. Uh, today, we see that uh, Jesus makes it really simple to call his followers. This version in John of the call of, uh, of Peter and Andrew is different than in the other gospel. But in this version, we see that Andrew, the brother of Simon, Simon Peter, gets called through the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was so powerful in his ministry, and people loved him and were devoted to him long after he got his head cut off. To this day, there are still uh, certain churches and certain variants of Christianity that uh, lean heavily on the ministry of John the Baptist. There's even a couple churches that say they have his head. <laughs> Somebody's got to be wrong, right? <laughs> but John's ministry, a lot of people came to Jesus through John's ministry. And you see in today's gospel, John almost like traffic directing. There's the Messiah. Everybody that comes to me, go to him. You're making a turn here, a turn towards someone who's greater than I. And that's why uh, Andrew and his companion so quickly and immediately started to follow Jesus. And that's how it is for us. Because Andrew starts to follow Jesus, and they ask him what he's up to, basically. And he says, come and see. Pretty simple evangelism, huh? Simple doesn't mean easy for us. We struggle with looking silly or being overly zealously religious or being embarrassed in public or someone thinking of us as some kind of Jesus freak nut. But Jesus makes it simple for us. Doesn't mean easy. So Andrew follows Jesus, and the first thing he thinks is, wow, other people that I love should really experience this. So he goes and he gets his hard-headed leader of a brother, Simon, and convinces him through his enthusiasm to at least give it a try. That should also sound kind of familiar. I know most of you, if not all of you, have talked to your children, your grandchildren, your aunts and uncles, nephews, nieces. If they are not connected to any church at all, you have invited them to church. You have invited them to come you maybe have prayed with them, maybe talked about why you're a Christian and why their mother or father isn't, if they're your grandchildren. They may have had questions. They may have come to you with tough questions. But like Andrew, our first impulse is to invite others to enjoy and enrich their life through following Jesus. That's why he went and got Peter. And Peter, of course, would make up his own mind. So we, too, have an obligation, explicitly from Jesus, to go spread the gospel and make disciples. That's why Christian formation is so essential. Because disciples are not born, they're made. And this is one of the factories where you make disciples. An important part, an essential part of what makes a disciple is understanding what their place is in the body of Christ. What their role is. It's not a place like you go to some other charity and you say, 
Well, I like, I like cooking pancakes, so when pancake supper comes up, I'll do that. I like taking care of the building, so when it's taking care of the building time, I'll be right there. I li- no, Jesus says for all of his disciples to go and spread the gospel. No, no, that's Lynn's job. That's your job. That's Sophie's. That's, that's the senior warden. Ju- that's the vestry job. No, not at all. That's each one of our jobs. And one of the things that we have failed at as an Episcopal church is we haven't even told people what their responsibilities are. It, and it's one thing to say, it's your job, and then say, good luck, see ya. We have a whole training center here designed to your specific situation to help you learn how to pray, how to meditate, how to study the scriptures how to understand your place in Christian history, your role on the Christian spectrum, how you relate to the rest of the churches in the diocese, the rest of the churches in the, in the uh, city. All those things you learn here, that's part of being made a disciple. You're not born with it. You shouldn't come in with a full developed idea of what it means to follow Jesus. You begin with those very first steps just like Andrew and his companion, and later just like Peter. So we are called, and we actually have the natural impulse to go and bring people aboard, people that are lost, people that are broken, people that are lonely, people that are hopeless, people that have had all kinds of nutty things poured into their mind that they think is the truth or will give them life or will give them peace. And it fails every time. And it's our job to come and pick up the scraps and invite them to wholeness. No matter how much they've been broken, they can still find wholeness. That's our job. And your ministry field, you may not think you have a ministry field. It's not like Sophie going down to uh, the, the mission for a year. Your mission field is already set for you. It's locked in. You already know it well. You're the expert in your ministry field. Who is, what is your ministry field? Everybody that you encounter? Every place that you go? That's your ministry field. It's a field in which you can build on the relationships that you have. Even if it's the barber or the salon or the the person at the checkout that knows you a little bit because you come every week. That's your ministry field, along with your congregation. So it's not a foreign place. It's not an unusual or extravagant place. It's not going to cost you any more money. It probably won't even cost you any more time to exercise your ministry in your ministry field. These are things that our Andrew and Peter are going to learn. But first they had to come and see. Didn't Jesus make a temple? Huh? Well, I'm down here. He could have said, I'm down here at this town here. Take a left and, you know, make sure you bring some blankets because there's going to be a lot of us and some food. We need some food. And he didn't say any of that. He just says, come on and see. I think we can all master that invitation. But there's more to see here in this church than Sunday morning service. So come and see. Come and see us do our outreach. Come to our fellowship. Come to a tamale training. You know, come and see our, uh, we're doing a prayer vigil. This is what we do sometimes when we are making important decisions. You might want to take a half an hour with me. Come here on the weekdays. I'm still kind of a little surprised, but remember most of my ministry has been in the city I'm a little surprised that people don't stop by here during the week to come into this space and to pray. I mean, maybe you got a really cool pray spot in your house. Maybe you got it like the shack, the book, the shack. Maybe you, maybe you got, you know, the most comfortable chair. Maybe you don't like these pews. That I don't, I don't know. But this is always an option. You know, we're open. Most of you have keys. 
<laughs> or living with someone who has two kids. <laughs> and come in, and uh, we don't have something like a, a little votive stand or something. Um, but uh, feel free, if you want, to light a candle, if that helps you when you pray. Uh, get your little cell phone and go on the internet and tap some religious music, if that'll help you, and, and have that play. Uh, Paul can give you a number of sites that are very useful for that kind of thing. Um, remember that you'll never be alone. The sacrament, the, the presence of Jesus in the sacrament of communion is always there. Also the, the sacrament of anointing in the oil. Always there when this building is open for you to wander in. If you like kneeling, kneel for a while. If you just like sitting, for a while. And guess what? The window looks pretty good when you can see it. When you have the, uh, the screen up. This is a, a place of prayer and a place you can learn how to pray. Many of you all take the day-by-day -day booklets. We have all those special eyes to other booklets about how to live a Christian life in different circumstances. We've got our whole calendar of ministries uh, on our web page. So everything that is public is, is right there for anybody. And you are invited to all of it if it's open to the public. So we have ways to be trained to be better disciples here. And that's what Jesus wanted him to come and see. I can't tell you everything Jesus is thinking. You guys don't need a list. You don't need a web page. You just need to come and experience it. And that's a lot what we've been doing in the last uh, nine, ten months, is going out in the community or in our ministries as we go out into the community as individuals, and we just say, come and see. Come and see, Taze. It may not be your cup of tea, but you may f find something really valuable there. Come and hear our musicians. It's not just straight organ. We play a variety of music here. Come to the different groups that meet. If you're interested in, in those kinds of things, come and see that we are the living church. When you encounter the people of the church, you encounter Jesus. You don't have to be in this space. This is a special space, yeah. Come and see Jesus in Katie's family. Come and see Jesus in our fellowship hall. Come and see Jesus when we're out in the park. Come and see Jesus when we're being vigil at home. There are lots of ways to come and see Jesus. There will be time when God will make it so obvious to you that this is your ministry field and this is a person that needs the word of God that you'll feel compelled. Other times you may have to push yourself because you have all those little things in the back of your head saying like, oh, don't look silly. That's, you know, don't, don't talk about religion to Taze. Don't invite that person. How well do you know? You don't know them that well. All those little things that make us hesitate. But that hesitation is what stunts the kingdom of God. And what stunts the kingdom of God stunts the future of this church. I don't want to be here if we're not doing the kingdom of God stuff anyway. And this institution shouldn't be. There's been a little talk about reverting to a mission and all that stuff. I don't care what name, what aspect we are in the institution of the church. Our job is to make disciples and build the kingdom. If we're not doing that, we have no reason for fundraisers and all this stuff. We don't have any reason. It has many reasons that all have to do with Jesus' mission. And when we do that, we can let go of the anxiety about so many other things. Like the question that I hope I will never hear again. Are you in Skinny staying? I don't want to hear that anymore. You hear me? I'm going to spank you. <laughs> no, really, it's a little insulting, like we got one foot out of the door, you know, like, 
you know, it's like being engaged, but well, if we're going to Christmas, I'll go with you Christmas, if we're still together. It's like saying that all the time. You know, it doesn't build a sense that you trust us. Or, and you're obviously thinking, we don't trust you. You have heard me write it. I mean, you've seen me write it, and now you've heard me say it. You all have taken care of us. You have loved us. You have nurtured us. You have welcomed us. Let's get on with the business now instead of wringing our hands all the time. Is there one more person or one less person on Sunday? Is there some, somebody who didn't show up to vestry? You know, all that stuff is to the side. What's on the walls? What's not on the walls? We need to get God's ministry rolling, and we need to spread the good news. This town needs good news. There are a lot of churches preaching hellfire and damnation and don't wear your skirts above your knees and no makeup and all that kind of stuff, no... You know, that kind of stuff, that kind of bad, what I call bad news. These people don't need that. There's a lot of people struggling out there, no matter what their economic circumstances. They need the good news, and you have it. And it's like you're saying, well, this is for me, though. This is for you. This is for me. It makes me feel good. It makes me have hope. It makes me have peace. Well, that's not all the only reason you have it. You have it to share and to multiply and if you want to, if you think Lynn is a good evangelist, well, then ask for some tips from Lynn. <laughs> you know? There are people that have advanced skills here in so many things. Hospitality, so many have hospitality skills. You don't even think of it. That's why when people encounter our congregation, all of a sudden they kind of change their attitude about what church is, what church can be. Because maybe they've experienced other churches with a bunch of do's and don'ts and requirements. And all we have to say is, come and see. Jesus is really good inside of these people at St. Paul. And that's a lot of what I say when I go out into the community. Just come and see. Not, we have the greatest organ in the world and we have the most best, we have the best preacher and the most slick liturgy. No, we have Jesus, and that's enough. Amen.